in 2006, we don't know why he came to Kansas. Maybe he doesn't know why he came to Kansas. But he accepted a position here, and since then, the program has grown to over $35 million in total funding in five years. So, uh, you can't argue with that, and, uh, but you can argue with Bob Honey, and here he is, and uh, enjoy the talk, and then we'll have a question and answer. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot, Bob. Uh, well, I, I, when I, Dennis asked me to do this, um, I had been mulling around in my mind, thought of the things that this organization and group has been talking about in terms of transportation uh, issues uh, that I thought were probably something we ought to at least be aware of with regard to new cities and uh, developing new city concepts. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some things that go on within several different disciplines, geography being one, but also planning and uh, economics and uh, uh, perhaps landscape architecture, although we don't have a landscape architecture program here. I wish we did, but you know, I keep talking to uh, John Dawn about the fact we ought to have one uh, to complement our urban transportation or urban uh, design program. But anyway, I always begin anything I'm doing with this that phrase, begin with the end in mind. I think it keeps my fanny out of trouble more times than I want to count. Because you can get lost real quick if you don't know where you're going. And so that's the title I chose. And then the other part of it is, here are some things for you to think about in terms of long life communities. We'll see if this works. Now this is what we don't want. This is what we have now. This is what the world does. As you can see, we get congestions. So what do we do? We, you know, all it does is we, we build more roads, like in Atlanta, Georgia, where now the beltway around Atlanta, I think, is up to 16 lanes, eight in each direction, which is unreal. And it's a parking lot. And so we build more infrastructure, we build, which attracts more people, which attracts more houses, and then you're back in the same trap, and it's a vicious cycle. And that's what we don't want. Now, if you're going to build a long life community, this is, these are the criteria that I would argue that we need to consider. You just can't pick any piece of property and think that it's going to work. Um, the property has, has to have the right type of accessibility characteristics. And you can't just plop it out in the middle of nowhere. It has to connect with the rest of the world. Uh, but that's, a, that's also important internally because you have to have the right type of accessibility internally to the, to the place as well. And I think very important, probably the most important part, it should convey a feeling of belonging. It should convey something like when you grew up, if you grew up in a small uh, community or something like that, you want to get that feeling back when you, you're retired or when you're moving into some place like that we're talking about. Um, so just what is transportation? Um, this is my definition. I didn't pull it from anybody else. I think a lot of other people use a similar de a definition. But transportation, in my estimation, is it moves people, services, and goods from a place of low utility, in other words, it doesn't have as much use, to a place of high utility. and applies for a lot of things, like electricity. If you have a power plant at a dam somewhere, that electricity that's generated is of no but value unless you can get it to where it can be consumed. Likewise, fruit crops, vegetables and so forth can't be you know you can't use them where you produce them unless you're you know if you're on the home garden and they have to get be, uh, transported to where they can be used and we do this with a variety of vehicles and I always argue that power transmission and power generation is just as much a transportation issue as it, any other buses trains anything else because all you're doing is moving electrons from one place to another place and a couple other things, um, 
It uses energy and it requires infrastructure to do that. It also takes your time and effort. The other thing is that you don't need transportation every moment of the day. One of the things we've learned here in Kansas for some of our communities is that uh, that have small transit systems that they need to reprogram their transit from one time to another time during the day. Uh, for example, in the morning you want people to get to their workplace, to the factories or whatever. At 10 o'clock or anywhere after 10 o'clock, there's a whole different clientele that needs to get somewhere. So we came up with the idea of flexible transit systems so that you use the same vehicles in the community that you move people to work early in the morning, but in, in the midday, you may have people who need to get to the doctor and get to the grocery store. And so you have a different set of routes that you apply. Come four o'clock or five o'clock, you switch back to the other routes. Um, it also costs money. That's one thing people don't really appreciate, the fact that uh, you have to spend money in order to have a good transportation system. But it also costs in terms of crashes, injuries, and, and, and also in fatalities. Now, for a couple of centuries now, people have been curious about transportation, and several, several very bright individuals early on developed some interesting models. One, one of the most, uh, uh, or the oldest, uh, transportation model is one developed by Johannes von Thunen in Germany. And von Thunen uh, lived on an estate that he married into. Uh, he had plenty of time on his hands. And so he could contemplate, you know, the landscape. And in that part of Germany, it's pretty flat, just like a good part of Kansas is. And so he speculated and came up with a model that uh, uh, re reflected how he thought agriculture production would uh, be produced if you only had one city and a plain. Then another German in the uh, 30s by the name of Walter Kristall, he came up with another idea called central place theory. And he used it to explain why it's, you had small cities, then a little bit larger cities, and then bigger cities, and but the number of those in each class varied. Also in the 30s, a guy named John Q. Stewart came up with an idea. He actually was a, a physicist to begin with and speculated that uh, physical laws could also apply to society in terms of people, how people interacted with each other. And then George K. Ziff came along about the same time and he had other things that he had developed with regard to what's called the rank size rule, the path of least resistance. Then we have another German coming along, Alfred Weber, who developed the industrial location theory. And finally, I mentioned something that was developed back in the 60s called R.S. Lowry's uh, land use model. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about any of these models, but I am going to give you some examples of, of the models. Um, first of all, let's talk about Tunin's model. Pretty simple, the dot in the center is the city. And what he rationalized was that, that certain land users would then arrange themselves around this city. It's Everything is uniform otherwise. Same fertility wherever, it doesn't really matter. And so the first ring out would be what he calls the white dairy uh, or marketing uh, ring. Now think back, what's the state of New Jersey known for? What's their motto? Garden, Garden State. Well, New York City, you know, at one time before we had refrigeration, uh, was the market. And so a lot of the vegetables and so forth that was supplied to New York City came from New Jersey. So that's why we call it the Garden State. As soon as refrigeration came along, then we could have vegetables all year long. That's when Florida came into the picture. Excuse me, I'm going to have to get more. Um, what's interesting is that if you look at the United States as a whole, you see these different rings sort of appearing all the way out here where grain would be further out, cattle would be even further out, and forest 
products would even be further out from the major market center, which for many, many years was the northeastern part of the United States. So you can see this staging, this arrangement of circles, even in the United States as it evolved. Now this is Christoph's model, and what he observed also on a plane in Germany was small cities seem to be lots of those. They have their own little trade area. Next size city up, it has its a little bit larger trade area. And then even larger communities have an even larger trade area. And so he developed his model. <coughs> and depending on the kind of economy, you had different kinds of arrangement, but they always, always were hexagonals. And that was done because if you're going to pack a box and you have X number of pieces to put in that box, the hexagon is the best shape to use because you don't have any wasted area. And so that's one reason why he chose the uh, hexagon. Then we have William J. Riley. I forgot to mention him a while ago. Riley came along also in the 30s and looked at how these trade areas that Christoph was, was talking about seemed to sort of bifurcate based on the size of the city. And so he designed a formula that you have here showing where the break point is between two cities. All of, you know, this city would have a much larger catchment area of market than the other city. Then Stuart came along with his gravity model. As I said, he was a physicist. And he essentially uh, looked at the way people interact with each other. It was interesting. One of the first research papers I ever wrote was um, when I was working on my master's degree at the University of Georgia. And I had this uh, guy that was my chair, my thesis for me. He was a quantitative geographer and probably one of the first ones around. <coughs> and, uh, he was all, always a, uh, had in, interesting ideas, and being a mathematician, I had a good time in his class because I knew what he was talking about, but all my colleagues there had no math background, background so I always got attacked after the class to go explain what he was talking about. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but anyway, basically what he's saying is that the mass of two cities is uh, the amount of exchange between the two cities pro proportional to the product of their size and the distance between them. So you, you can see that P1, P2 has much more, uh, much more traffic between it than P, well, the two cities the same size. And this applies in air travel. And so one of the things I looked at back in the 60s was the amount of air travel all around the United States between major cities and come to find out this model worked pretty good, except we had one anomaly that we had to explain where we had a lot of traffic between Chicago and New York to uh, Tampa St. Pete. And it was far beyond what the two should have based on the model. Anybody have any idea why? It's important relative to what we're talking about in this meeting. Yes, sir. Elderly relatives in Florida? Well, the people retired to Florida, and so they were going back home to visit family or whatever. So there was an inordinate amount of extra travel between those points and Florida because of that. So, uh, so you can't trust the model to give you all the answers. You've got externalities that you also have to look into. Um, Seth noticed this. These are a whole host of different countries, and one of the things he noticed was that if you counted up cities of different size, in the United States, for many, many years, you had what we call the rank side rule. And it said that you got New York City, and it's the biggest city. The next city is going to be at least half or some proportion of that size. Chicago, LA, two cities. Step down another level. Then you would have smaller cities at, at that time, Atlanta, which is now really actually grown pretty, pretty aggressively. But you had a whole bunch of other cities like Houston and so forth, and there would be even more of those. And then you get down to Lawrence's or you know, some little town nearby, there would be a whole host of those. It's also borne out by Christoph's model, you know, where he showed he had lots of little dots for the little small cities. So the rank size rule also applies. He also speculated that 
human beings, being a sociologist, he also speculated that we're pretty lazy and we're going to take the path of least resistance. When you lay in a new campus or a new uh, lawn for a business and so forth, a lot of people nowadays don't put sidewalks in until later because they wait and see where everybody walks and then you put the sidewalk in because we tend to take the path of least resistance. And so this is, uh, uh, this actually is Muir Woods, one of my favorite places in the world. But you also have to remember that uh, one of Ziff's also dictums is that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. Now, uh, this is Vapor's model, and he actually built an analog model. And I don't have a photograph of it, but he actually built a map of Germany, and they were looking at steel production, and so you had coal and limestone and, and other raw materials that you had to put in, and so he essentially put weights, how much you needed of each of those raw resources in, and put it where it was actually produced, and then he actually let the weights fall, and that would define where the ideal site was for the, the uh, uh, steel manufacturing block, including the, the market, which is here. So it's another concept. Now this is Lowry's model, and I don't, I'm not even gonna read it to you, but the comment made at the bottom says, obviously the Lowry model has several limitations. No kidding. Um, he was a very smart guy out in California at Rand Corporation, and um, he was one of the first ones that came up with a, uh, a, land, a land use model that predicted what should go in what location. And you can obviously see all of these equations, uh, which may or may not work. All right. Uh, let me get to my location here. Now let's get into the, the fun part of the talk. And, How many of you have seen this in your life, an old country story? This one is in Alabama. Uh, I think this is a 1930s uh, photo. But in my life, you know, I grew up in Georgia and, and the, all over the South, lived in Tennessee, I lived in Florida and so forth. So this was a pretty common sight for me. Uh, and I did some of my master's thesis work, or excuse me, PhD thesis work looking at these kinds of of, uh, issues and the question always arises so well, how much how many people does it take to support one country store mm -hmm. um, and this is based on the concept that you're uh, getting back to Ziff's ideas about uh, path of least resistance if you lived out in the boonies and you had a store some distance from you at some point theoretically Unless you absolutely needed to stay alive, you would do without rather than go that distance to get what you want. And at a minimum, you would only go infrequently to go that distance to get what you needed. So there is some economic limit to the range of a good that defines a market region. And it takes so many people in that market region for you to survive as a store owner. And you can't lose sight of that if you're building a planned community of any type. You've got to keep that in mind. So, um, and this scientist or, or re researcher says it takes 250 people for a convenience store and a theater, 150,000 people. And my wife last night said, that doesn't sound right. I said, well, think about it. We've got two theaters that I know of. We got the Liberty downtown, which probably serves a, what less less than half of what the other one does uh, on the south side. Mm -hmm. And we got about seventy, I mean about ninety thousand people here in Barnes. Or you know, if you go for the county, it's more like a hundred something. So you know, that rule of thumb actually works pretty well. Well, it was a. Uh, another geographer actually called himself a rural sociologist in um, Illinois who was out doing a study one time looking at a community called Princeton, Illinois and another nearby town called Dodge, Illinois. And he was just simply curious about the 
uh, market area for Princeton. And so he would go out on the country roads surrounding the town and he would notice the driveway connections, as you can see here. Now, the reason I show this uh, is that this is actually, these two don't really apply too much, but this is color infrared photography. In color infrared photography, if you heard Dennis say I'm into remote sensing, you actually get part of the invisible light to you shows up on the imagery. It's in the near, what we call the near infrared. And it happens to show tire marks on roads and asphalt and everything pretty dang well. So one of the things I did in my early career was uh, we had some access to some of this photography from NASA. And uh, it was being flown right before the satellites started going up and NASA had given us money to try to find out what we could do with this stuff. That's basically what they said. We called it the serendipity era because, you know, you didn't know what you were going to get. So I looked at it and I noticed this and I remember this article about the, by this uh, geographer mapping out these uh, railroad or these uh, road connections, you know, driveway connections and the farmsteads in Illinois. And sure enough, you could define that. The area we were looking up, uh, looking at, was around Asheville, North Carolina. And then I went back in Riley's model that I showed you the breakpoint. I calculated those and I laid that map down on top of the map that I had drawn with the photography. And guess what? It almost perfectly mapped. I couldn't believe it, how, how close they, they actually came. So we behave pretty much like what some of these models say we do. And that's a very important point to remember. Uh, here's an actual piece of his map. And here's the break point he mapped out. This is Dodge this way and Princeton is this way. Um, so he, but he was doing this by hand out in the field. Now another thing that you need to pay attention to is I remember when I was uh, back in Knoxville, Tennessee, working with the uh, local uh, uh, planning department. And they were trying to plan new routes for the transit systems in, in Knoxville. And one of the heads of the uh, department was was adamant that he hated to ride buses. He would not ride a bus again if you forced him by gunpoint because they were just absolutely useful to a dealer somewhere out on the side of town, back in, on the edge of town, that he worked on. And then he hopped on the bus to go to work. And he had to go all the way downtown, transfer to another bus, and go back out to where his office was. So he got through at 4, four o'clock. They told him that the place was closing at 5, so he had an hour which it wasn't too many miles. It was like four or five miles in and about five miles out. Well, he barely made it. <laughs> in other words, he went 11 miles in one hour. And that was his reason for not doing that. Now, of course, what they did was they solved this by having what they call the cross, you probably heard about of the Crosstown bus. That's what they're talking about. They put one now in so you can go across diagonally to, to the radius. But that's something also to keep in mind if you're building a community about how do you get, get access. But the one of the most important uh, arguments, though, you need to make is with regard to how many people it takes to support some type of economic activity. My presumption would be that we're going to have some kind of grocery store nearby. You're going to have to have maybe some medical assistant, you might even have a movie theater of some kind. Uh, each of those, in order to make a go of it, have to have a customer base that they can count on. And remember the rule about 20%, 80%, that their money's going to be made from about 20% of the customers. You got to keep that in mind. So it's not all of the 100% of the people living there, you probably want to get 20% of those people who are going to be willing to use that facility. So it's a very important economic consideration. Um, what's your, and then the other things deal with what you're actually uh, doing. Now, if you're, you had a heart attack, there's no elasticity in what you'll pay to go to the hospital or 
you know, ambulance comes get you, you're going to pay the price. The helicopter comes get you, you're going to pay the price if you want to live. And so it's not an elastic uh, factor. You don't sit there and negotiate it with the helicopter pilot, you know, how much is this going to cost. Also, commuting. When you think about it, the reason people will sit in an LA, on an L.A. freeway for hours and hours is because they don't have any choice. They've got to go to work. You've got to get the paycheck. And so you spend an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time waiting in line, you know, waiting for the next car in front of you to go on. And you'll pay that price, uh, even though we know that that's not the most efficient way to move people around. Now, the country store would only have a certain limit of goods that they would provide. If you wanted to buy a refrigerator, where do you think that farmer went? He didn't go to Princeton. He might go to Princeton, but he would go to another much larger city, probably to get a better deal. Because if he had more appliance stores in the city, he could do some uh, uh, shopping and maybe come up with a better price if, if the other competitor will deal with it. A special event's a, a little bit uh, more elastic. You, you, you go to concerts and things like this. Uh, my wife and I have traveled to as far as Atlanta to go to hear somebody like uh, uh, Bob Seeger or somebody like that. <laughs> Uh, I'll, you know, my, Seeger's one of my favorites, so I'll go pretty long distance to, the, to hear him. Uh, social activities and recreation also, there's a lot of variability in the price you'll pay for that. Also, you need to pay attention to the network. Landscape dictates how the routes get laid out, okay? In Kansas, it's pretty nice. You know, we've got a township and range system, it's flat. You can almost get to anywhere when you, if you know which way you're heading, you've got a compass in your car, you pretty well, uh, you can find a road to get to where you want to go eventually. Because all you got to do, do is go north or south and you'll find an east-west road eventually and if that's where you head, all you got to do is turn. It may dead end, but you'll, it'll dead end into another road and you can branch off of there. So it's wonderful about that. but. In Tennessee or Georgia or any of the 13 original colonies, they all were surveyed on what's called the Beats and Bounds Survey, which was sort of like throw a rock, but that's a, where the end of the property is. Um, and so accessibility is an issue. A and C, you, you can get on the network, so you can get from one point to another point, but if you want to get to all points most efficiently, B is where you want to be, somewhere in the middle. And so that consideration has to be to take, uh, considered also when you're locating a, facility, uh, a uh, planned community. Then one of the other issues is that time is not, uh, a distance is not time. They don't equate. You know, we all know that. You know, I can go from South Lawrence to North Lawrence umpteen different ways, but the crow fly route is not the fastest. It usually is to go around somewhere. If, you, if I'm going to Ed Martinko's place, I usually get on the, on the turnpike and <laughs> go out here on Iowa and all the way out to the turnpike, hop in, I can get over to the other uh, exit off the turnpike and get to where he is, his facility is uh, much more quickly than I can going through town. And so the average speed is a, is a very important issue in terms of your access. So access is not necessarily accessibility. That's the point there. And so lifelong communities must consider a balance between all of these, and the definitions are these. And the reason I provided the handout is I thought people would, you know, you're not going to have to take time to read all this stuff, but you might want to know what all of these variables are because all of them play a role in terms of making the decision of what you, what you, what you build and where you build. And these are all things that have to be thrown into the mix. Let me know what that is. When I was a kid, um, we lived right on the edge of town in Athens, Georgia. And uh, 
I think um, I could be in the country in less than a quarter mile uh, right on the edge of town. Because I, I used to be like the uh, little kid at uh, Christmas Curry with the BB gun. I find I got actually I got a daisy, and that's what I had. And I would uh, love to you know walk off and get off and play in the bushes and the brambles and everything. And it was just about a quarter mile from my house. That's how, how close to the edge of town we were. But we had this guy who had a wagon and. I didn't know if it was a horse or a mule or whatever, but he would come quite often, probably twice a week or at least once a week. And my mother would always go out and buy something from him because he had fresh vegetables and all that. And uh, those were fairly common. I don't know if you had that experience, but uh, it was great that somebody would come and bring you that because I always liked when she fixed a, you know, fixed a uh, okra, fried okra. I love fried okra. And she also would fix, uh, in, the, in the fall, you get cauliflower. And most of my kids won't even eat cauliflower, but I loved it. I, you know, I, I still do. And even uh, broccoli, I love it. So it was almost year round that you got something. And he all even sold meat occasionally because he had his own animals that he raised and um, butchered. Well, one of the things we need to think about today is what if the you going what if instead of you going to the box store the box store came to you and it has to do with accessibility it's not in the past people located because of location it was location location those were the three rules for locating a business today I would argue it's accessibility 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 and yo as yoga Barra says the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> Let me tell you what the future might be. This is something I think that will play a role here. We better think about it. Now, you probably heard on the radio or on TV in the last two weeks stories about 3D printing. <coughs> Anybody? Mm -hmm. All right. That's the next big thing. I have a nephew, actually he's my wife's nephew, and he, he works in industry, works for Deloitte, and he goes to every, you know, the large businesses, and he claims, and I have no doubt that he's right, that the next revolution in manufacturing is going to be this 3D printing. Um, and I, I was hoping that uh, Greg Thomas would be here today, I don't see him. But he has a machine where he actually can do 3D printing. They're not expensive now. They're about $2,000. In fact, TRI bought one for the uh, aerospace uh, class so they could make pieces for their airplanes to fly. It prints it out in plastic. Now, some of you know that we have a plant over at Kansas City that everybody calls the Honeywell plant. It's run by Honeywell. That's why they've got a Honeywell plant. They call it internally the Kansas City plant. They just spent $2 million to buy a 3D printing machine that prints in titanium and aluminum. And so it prints a little dot of aluminum or titanium, it zaps it with a laser instantaneously, fuses it, and it builds up a part just like that. And the company that manufactures it likes to demonstrate it by producing a thumb wrench with the thumb actually, part actually working. And that's how accurate it is. And you don't have to shrink it or fire it or cook it or do anything to it. It's ready to use. And uh, how many of you know what, how milk is delivered in England? Anybody? No. You do? No, I thought you said raise your hand. Well, let me see if we can get this uh, video to work. <laughs> We're lucky it will. The more electric trucks on the Chicago streets. That's because a big name in electric trucks will soon be building them. Here in Chicago, CBS 2's Ed Curran says there is extra incentive for companies to make the switch to batteries. 
Smith Electric Vehicles is coming to Chicago. The mayor says it'll mean jobs. Smith will start with uh, somewhere close to about 100 jobs and with the potential of the orders coming, grow to about 200 jobs. To sell those trucks, a voucher program backed by federal funds will cover about 60% of the upcharge that comes when you buy an electric vehicle, giving our trucks a price advantage over those built at Smith's other two plants. And that's pretty amazing for someone who's looking to get into a vehicle like this. Well, it, it really is. You know, the, the reality of an electric truck is you, you pre-buy a bunch of oil. Battery is expensive. It makes the actual upfront acquisition price higher, but your operating costs are almost seventy percent less on a per mile basis. Coca-Cola, Frito-Lay, and FedEx all use Smith trucks. This is a one hundred percent electric FedEx truck. This truck can charge up overnight and can take a driver throughout his whole route over an eight-hour day. <coughs> the route in the city isn't that long. 30, 40, 50 miles is very, very typical for a route delivery in a market like this. Going electric's been a great move for FedEx. It's great for the environment, and we're not dependent on foreign oil when we're using our own electricity. Smith Electric is considering several Chicago sites. In the back of the yards neighborhood, Ed Kerr, CBS2 News. Oops. <coughs> well, <laughs> there we go. All right, another issue I want to raise to this group that is thinking and planning and contemplating how this thing is going to look is do we really think we can live as one big happy family? Now, my friend back here, Glenn Harrison, that works with me, provided me these view graphs, and they're a little bit dated, but they uh, for, illustrate something. This is uh, Washington, D.C., the vicinity of Washington, D.C. These are census tracts, and the color reflects the percent of that particular uh, group of people in that census tract. So red is 100%. And 75% is orange, yellow is 50%, and so forth. And so you see here in D.C. where the whites live. Here's where the whites or the blacks live. Here's where the uh, Hispanic live, and here's where the Asian live. And I can flip back and forth, but you got the graphs in, in your handout that you can look at. Uh, even though we've had you know, desegregation for years now, we still have this problem that we have, uh, we don't all commingle like we were all hoping, idealistically hoping. And people sort of tend to get together. And I, I, I try my best not to be that way myself. But I think it's somewhat innate in our nature that we sort of gravitate to people we like, you know, that are like us and so forth. So this is an issue I think we've got to deal with socially in terms of building these communities. You've got to wrestle with it and come to grips with it and deal with it and understand what you're dealing with, which I think is a healthy way to, to look at it. And I, I wanted to just bring that out as something that you needed to consider. These are other questions I think that we need to address. You know, we talked about having mixed incomes in this area. Does I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, I'm just saying does it make sense, to, you know, we need to wrestle with that. And we talked about having young kids, young families, and older families, a mixed stage of life. And I think that's great, but there are different requirements. If you have young families, you got schools you gotta have. And you wanna have them close at hand, I would think. Otherwise, your neighborhood's not really gonna be attractive to some of, some of the families. Uh, mixed backgrounds. You know, we talked about maybe having communities that were medical community related, people who were, you know, doctors or nurses or provided medical uh, services and so forth. They retired, then you put them back in a community where uh, some function of that community might be still medically related, maybe a clinic or an institute or something of that nature. Mixed religions. Uh, you know, you, you have a whole host of religions now that you have to accommodate. How is that going to play out? And then the fact that we're not as all mobile as other folks. Some people, maybe a returned veteran from Iraq or Afghanistan with uh, an amputated leg or other uh, 
uh, injuries compared that to somebody who goes out and runs 10 miles a day or something like that. Does that make sense? Now, here's C side, and you may have heard of it. Uh, there was one family that owned all the land. The family inherited it from the father, and they decided they were going to build this community, this planned community. This is it. And you can go online and look at it. It's bright white and white in more ways than one. And, uh, uh, and it's great, I suppose. You can go down to the beach. Uh, it's on the Gulf Coast, not too far from Pensacola. Uh, they have mixed uh, activities going on in the in the community. But y'all, did y'all ever remember to see the Stepford Wives? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's sort of, I don't know why, it just reminded me of that type of atmosphere. That's not quite where I think I want to live. Uh, so I was thinking about what make, what kind of brings warmth back to my heart. You know, I grew up in Athens, Georgia. And I always ask people this, uh, why this is the case. This is where we had a um, newsstand. And it was interesting to me, this is off of Google Earth, you, you know, with, uh, what is it? Uh, Street View. Uh, Street View, yeah. And it, this little lock tells me that that is now a place that sells knives, but I think it's gone belly up because I couldn't find it online. The, the website they had didn't, you know, was, said it was, didn't exist. So I don't know what's there now. It's interesting to me that the doors are still there the way they were when it was a, a, a newsstand because what they would do is open the doors up and the racks were on the inside so they would face out. You could you know, look at all the magazines and everything like that. Um, and they sold everything else you wanted. They were nickel dime type things. I always ask, well, why, you know, this is the main two, the main intersection of the town. Why is that place, or was that place there? Anybody? If you wanted to build a store and you only had, you're going to sell nickel dime items? What's your customer requirement? Volume. 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 Lots of volume. And in those days, the highest density of people walking by is going to be right there. And that's, that's why the store was there. And it was successful for many, many years, I'm sure. Likewise, when you put stores into these communities, you got to think about that. The customer base, that 20% rule comes into play. And so you have to work, you know, worry about that. And by the way, those trees weren't there, I guarantee you. Uh, but uh, anyway, so instead of saying the end in mind, the place in mind must consider transportation to be successful, but it also must give you some sense of belonging. That's it. Any questions? Pardon? How do they deliver milk in England? Oh, I, I'm sorry. They <laughs> deliver milk in electric vehicles in England. And the reason why is nobody wants to hear those vehicles in the morning going around. So they're, they're very, very quiet. And, um, uh, and so Smith has been, very, they've been in business in England for 30 years. And they have a factory now over here at uh, Kansas KCI Airport. And they're making these vehicles here in the United States. And their idea, I think, is very solid. I, the CEO has been here and talked to our transportation people. He came in and gave a talk on what they're doing. We, we tried, we actually did get a small contract with him. Uh, one of our uh, uh, PhDs, uh, faculty members in mechanical, has a little small contract with them to help them with some energy efficiency issues they're dealing with. His idea is that he's trying to hit the FedEx and the uh, UPS and perhaps uh, we don't have milk delivered anymore, but anything where you have lots of short distance deliveries that you have to make going around. And the reason he's doing that is because as the batteries get drained down, 
the cargo becomes less. So his weight can be great at the beginning, but as he delivers, his volume of weight, I mean, his weight diminishes, and so it matches with his battery life. And, uh, so I'm hoping he makes a go of it. And he's targeting FedEx and some of those others. Yes, sir. Can you go back to your make sense uh, slide? We have those list of questions. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Dr. Temple, sir. Maybe go back on the keyboard. On the oh, yeah. Page up. No, it's not active. Hit escape first. There. Now hit back. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> Good. There. See this? There you're. Oh, those. Okay, I was going to go with here. <laughs> well, the, my response to that, those questions, is that it made sense that where I lived and grew up. That's exactly how I lived and grew up. You probably did too. If you go down to Old West Lawrence or East Lawrence, if you look at the disposition of houses and who lived there, you didn't have people who were segregated out by class, uh, race, um, backgrounds, religions, or mobility. You had them all living together really quite well in the 19th century, into the 20th century. That's why so I my said, question is, why can't it happen in the 21st century? Instead of like at uh, Seaside. Well, Seaside or, is or a million thing. places like Of course. Or, or a million places like Yeah. I, you know, I don't have an answer to that. I, you know, that. That's what I'm referring to of getting, you know, feeling comfortable where you live. Yeah. That's where I would feel comfortable when I had all that mixture around. Yeah. I don't so, think Dennis is quite right. West Lawrence had a different population than East Lawrence, just on two sides of Massachusetts. Isn't that right, Dennis? Well, wait, look, well, I'm right in this sense, uh, Dr. Godwin. There were black people and there were poor people living across from very wealthy people in the 19th century and in the 20th century in both sides of town. Now, if you looked at the preponderance, most of the working class were the concentration of working class was east side and the concentration of merchant class was west side. But you still had a great deal of interconnection between people because they live right across the street, right next door, right over the alley uh, in that period. Now, whether that's true in Old West Lawrence today, I think it is to a certain extent, not so much as it was earlier. It is true in East Lawrence today. But it's true in East Lawrence today. There are all sorts of people living together. And so I realize that that maybe has changed somewhat in the last 25 years or so. But if you look at the houses and their sizes, you know that this is not a rich person living right across from 713 uh, Louisiana who lived in a little hell house, <laughs> as opposed to this huge uh, kind of mansion. 713 Indiana. So that's what I'm talking about. So it did work at some point. And it's still working in East Lawrence, maybe less than West Lawrence. There's probably a lot of inter intermingling in Mass on Massachusetts Street where everybody shopped and next to. Well, that was also problematic, particularly for black people. Yeah, you, could, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, shop in some places on Mass Street. So yeah, it could work. Yes. I, I disagree on, on one other area in terms of home. Ownership. If the black person could not get a loan, own a home in Orange, Kansas, well in the 1950s. Well, I can show you places where black, black people, people live. bought homes, yeah. but they came financed from somewhere else. Maybe true, but they, they were there. They bought the home with cash and moved in, as opposed to having the bank loan. In the 19th century, most banks didn't do any mortgaging. Well, like wherever so so lots of people were financed outside of the banking business. But uh, I can show you lots of black houses, well, we, we, houses there. Yeah. The, the interesting thing I was thinking about that transcended that was to go to a little bit more the era that I was in as opposed to a little bit later. In the 50s and 60s as we built the early 
traditional housing in the 50s and 60s. Think of the one-story home in East Lawrence, further east, and the more traditional homes on the south side of the campus. Those homes were intermixed by working people slash uh, professors slash uh, business people as those new developments came up. And it wasn't until the Albemarle phenomena came on the west side of Castle and not beyond that, that had a sense that there was a wealthy place in Lawrence to live versus people who lived in the middle class houses that were over, think of around 19th in Louisiana and the development there from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. You can just take it south all the way across 23rd and south down to about 27th Street as those houses were built. That was a total intermingling of culture and Lawrence because it was all races and it was all all wage, all sorts of different wages in those in those homes were being built in that area. Yes, sir. Um, if I had a, a a canvas that was blank, I could probably build a community that you've just described. However, I have sixty five hundred parcels of vacant land in my county in what we call a land bank and um, I'm trying to wrap my arms around <clears throat> how do I take that opportunity and apply what you just just uh, spoke about in terms of the transit, the mobility, the economic, the, the, the rooftops to create the commerce and I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking okay Gordon, you're in the city manager's office, and, and who do you who do you bring to the table, other than your planners and my transit director, and maybe some investment bankers to talk about this opportunity of you got 6,500 parcels of vacant land in this thing called a land bank that you know a lot of urban communities are putting land in land banks all across the country trying to figure out how to do redevelopment. Um, how do you start that conversation? Uh, with folk uh, when uh, you, know, you have these political considerations um, that get in the way of this sort of raw theory. And, and I'm not sure if I have a question in there somewhere, but <laughs> I just, I, just an observation, I guess. Well, it, there is a question. And it, uh, all I'm trying to point out is that there's some longstanding economic issues that we've studied for hundreds of years that don't go away. Right. Just, you know, that you have to have somebody that pays attention to them. And you also have some of the nostalgia that that I'm feeling, you know, getting the picture of where I used to live. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, you know I, my, I grew up in the house I was born in. And uh, not many people could say that. Uh, we had uh, two bedrooms and a porch that became my bedroom. And, uh, you know, we weren't rich by any means. My grandfather was an engineer for the state and for the city. And uh, so we, we uh, had a pretty nice little place. And as I said, it was like a quarter mile from the edge of town. The nearest grocery store was less than a quarter mile from me, I could walk and go get, my mother would give me 35 cents, go down and get a loaf of bread, four or five slices of bologna, and that was lunch. Um, but uh, that was what made me, you know, when I think back how comfortable those years were, uh, that's what I would like to get back to. But I, and I think there are a lot of people like that. Yeah. Well, okay, so you, this was in Athens, right? Yeah. And what year approximately, or what decade? 40s. <laughs> 40s. 40s? 40s? Okay, 40s. 40s. You know, which would be a similar description of Lawrence in that time frame. Not dissimilar. You know, one of the things that strikes me is that the evolution of suburbia and people just evaporating into the nether regions uh, had that had as much of an effect, a profound effect on the way people interact as any 
thing. And, you know, I mean, that's not particularly profound. We all know that if we study suburban sprawl and, and the dynamics associated with it. But the question is how within this now, like uh, Gordon was saying, uh, you know, we have a matrix that's been created for us. You know, we have the ribbons of freeways and interstates and highways and roads. And so many people live out yonder, West Lawrence now, that didn't exist. You know, that would have been the country that you escaped to, right? So how do we engender a sense of integration, whether it's demographics or race or any other, you know, set of characteristics, when there are so many options? I mean, you know, when, when we can just sort of disappear and, well, that's an, I, I, that strikes me as being a question that needs to be answered. You know, one, one misconception from the beginning is I showed Washington, D.C. That's a large area. If you went down to a, a neighborhood area, you might get this mixing that Dennis was talking about. I mean, I have uh, the minister for the AME Church lives across the street from me. And uh, he's one of my best friends. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, we keep talking about moving out, but I just like the fact that I'm in this kind of mixed neighborhood. And, um, it, they've got one of these uh, rest homes across the street from it now that I guess the state allows them to have convert residential homes into small rest homes right now. And so that's fine with me. We don't have any problem with it at all. Um, I think. <coughs> when you're building these communities, you, you sort of have to keep these ideas in mind. And you're absolutely right about the uh, interstates and so forth. We did it wrong. <laughs> the Eisenhower era, era of interstates were built incorrectly because what it did was sever neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You know, and essentially <clears throat> slice cities up in the you know, pie-shaped areas. In fact, uh, when I was still in graduate school, one of the things we looked at was the spread of disease. Uh, and NIH and uh, NSF paid us to develop models, and one of the things we found out was that the interstates acted as barriers to preventing uh, disease from going from one neighborhood across the interstate to the other. It was confined to one area on one side. And so when you mapped it out, you could see what the impact was. But the other thing we also discovered as we went in and interviewed people was that they missed the fact that they had a friend on the other side of that interstate that they don't see anymore. Because he or she or whatever, you know, was somehow further away from them. They would have to go all the way down to an underpass. And like in, New in uh, Washington, D.C., there are only 13 underpasses or overpasses on the uh, Beltway. In Washington, D.C., you get in and out. If you ask me how I know this, I'll tell you something I couldn't have told you some years ago. But I was on a committee that looked at terrorism in, in, in Washington, and we were worried about having somebody come through with a bomb and how many entry points did I have to cover in order to hopefully catch somebody that's trying to bring a nuclear weapon into, into uh, D.C. So all I got to cover is 14, uh, 13. Now you can bring it overland in a backpack nowadays, but at that time you know, it was a pretty big package. Yes. A couple of questions. In your model that you've got here, a couple of things come to mind. One is, how do you take the existing as you're talking about? You know, you talked about know where you want to go, but you also have to start with where you are. And so if you start with where you are and you know where you want to go, one of the barriers between here and there you have to overcome. Whether it be an interstate or here in Lawrence, the river is a very good oh, yeah. example. Yeah. If you live on the north side of the river, you're basically disconnected from a whole lot of stuff unless you get across the bridge there right. on 6th Street. Yeah. So we have some natural topography things that create barriers. We have some street designs that create barriers. Uh, we have some strengths also here in Lawrence. The downtown area has always been a strength of uh, the community. So how do we take advantage of those strengths? How do we recognize the barriers and move from where we are over the next number of years to something where this makes sense? Well, again, it's whether it's a clean slate or not. You know, I, I think 
in an al already existing system, there's a whole different set of issues, you know. And uh, I think Lawrence has dealt with it well because I think, you know, I, I realized there was, there was a history of turmoil in, in Lawrence many years ago, but I think much of that's gone now, and there is this sort of co-mingling, and, and that's what we love about uh, Lawrence living. Um, but if I got a clean slate, I've got a different story. What am I going to recreate? And that's why I mentioned begin with the end in mind. What do you want? You know, if, if you want to have different mixes of incomes, race, religions, and so forth, that's fine. But no, going in, you know, what all the issues and problems could be when you try to make that happen. Now, I don't think you can build that into any kind of community at the onset because the decisions get made by people independently as to whether or not they want to live there. But I think if you provide the amenities that maybe remind them of their childhood and the ability to get from one place to another place uh, quickly and have access to all the things that they sort of want to have, I think that's a start. So as you're planning communities, I'm just trying to give you some a menu of things that you need to worry about. Yes, ma'am. I have a concern and an observation. One of the goals in whatever we're doing is uh, to build a university affiliated community. And I'm concerned with the nature of that affiliation. I think it's essential that whatever we build serves the university's mission, which is in terms of education and research and training of our students. So part of the challenge here is to find ways in which to move our students out to this community and to embed them in this community, whether they are clinical psychology students providing caregiver support groups, students from uh, Cheryl Lester's uh, aging and film class who might be watching movies with residents and talking about how aging is depicted in, in films. Uh, we need to move the students to the community and back to campus in a very timely fashion. So I think one of the challenges is that the perception of time and distance and accessibility and barriers probably depends upon your perception, your perception as a resident versus perception as a student. So I want those of you who do these kinds of planning and design things to keep that in mind, that we have challenges in moving students, whether it's the parking situation, a disastrous parking situation <laughs> on campus, or the uh, limitations <laughs> of the uh, uh, KU city bus system, we're going to have to figure out a way of getting the students out there and getting them back for for their next class. I, I totally agree with you. In fact, you know, as many of you know, we, our, our idea here was that we were hoping to get a piece of this land at the endowment and you know, on the West Campus to build these little, you know, build a community. You know, I don't know if that's in the cards yet or not, or probably not. Uh, but you know, I got my PhD at the University of Florida. They built one on the south east side of the campus, and it's made them two million. Well, I was told my cousin works down there, and he says made two million dollars. Twenty. Twenty. They cite twenty. Okay. Twenty million. Great. And uh, and Shan's teaching hospitals on that side too, which is great also. Um, so, you know, I think. Yeah, and this is, but I also will point out that this is a special type of situation where we have a university. Uh, Seaside probably doesn't have any academic component whatsever, and I'm not sure. A whole lot of things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so like Jimmy Buffettville, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been there. I, 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 I've been by it, but I never have been in uh, but anyway, I, those are the issues that I think, what type of community you want to build. The idea of linking it to the academic world, I think, is great because a lot of people would come to that type of environment because they're reminiscing about the days they were here in school and they want to kind of reclaim that. And we're all like that, you know. Um, I wish I could still play football, but I can't. 
because I enjoyed it when I was playing. But uh, I still go to the gym, lift, lift, lift weights, and work out. But uh, I'm not going to get out there on the field with you, I'm guessing. I have a question because my dad says that most people in this room are boomers. Would that be right? Most yeah, of the year was born between 1946 and 1964. There were some old guys like me and you who are out of that, but uh, our lives are all formed by the boomers. The last survey that I saw about boomers and if they wanted to live in intergenerational communities was 92% said they did and 8% said they didn't. Uh, what now? 92% oh, said they did. Again, it's in this utopian vision here that, that yes, it makes sense. 92% were interested in this just like you are, and 8% wanted to age segregated communities. 8%. I'm just wondering how many people, just out of your kind of internal guts here, how many people would, if, if this utopia were possible, how many people would prefer it over age segregated uh, is there anybody? What, what, what are you voting? Go. Which way are you voting? <laughs> <laughs> let's, go, let's vote for the smaller number, I think. Okay. How many prefer age segregated communities? You don't have to be embarrassed, really. Is there nobody yes. here? Yes. Nobody. So somehow, age. somehow the answer <laughs> is the answer yeah. Somehow the answer to this question for me. Can you exclude so teenagers? That, 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 that makes sense, but can we do that? Is the first question. Which is, I think, one of the issues that Susan Kinter is saying. Can we do it? Can we find a way to connect the university students and, and residents to make this uh, affiliation between the university and private, which is really a key to this community, I think. Sounds like you would move here if we could build it, and it, if it worked, you you would like it. Yeah, I, I I don't think you have a problem with that. I think there's a huge demand for what you're talking about doing. I'm just saying, well, you yeah. got to do it carefully, and there's a spatial component <coughs> that I'm trying to bring to the fore that, that has to be considered. Because you know, I I don't want to see somebody build something like this and put in something that they expect is going to be able to survive some poor guy running the business goes belly up because somebody didn't think ahead of time how many people are going to need to, he's going to need to keep staying in business so those components and then the other thing is that as the community ages you've got to make, remember there's some other things that you've got to take into consideration too which has to do with access i could see this model solving some emerging uh, really uh, intergenerational social problems in my community um, I'm told we have a considerable number of grandparents who are raising grandchildren and they don't have appropriate uh, residential or housing for this kind of specialized group. I, I could see applying some of these concepts to that small niche and then building out in a, into a larger community and you solve a problem and you maybe create sort of this end in mind of Here's what could happen if you really did some careful planning and some really good citizen engagement. I think you're right. Let, let me remind everybody, you know, I, I set up there in you know, one of the slides, we're on the cusp of something. The one thing I forgot to mention to you is um, what I think is going to happen. You know, that, you know, that, you know if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But, I also happen to have just been uh, exposed to 3D visualization. And uh, as I showed you the electric vehicle, Smith electric vehicles, for one reason, because I think that's reality that you could. But a piece of that also is you being able to order what you want online. And part of this, you could go to your computer screen and order something, but you have no idea how big it is what shape it is, whether it's going to fit in your, in your room. Let's say you're ordering a chair. You don't know if it's going to fit in the room that you want uh, want to use it in or not, even though women seem to have a better ab ability to do that than men uh, in terms of uh, where it would go. Uh, well, there, I'm a geographer, and I'll tell you this. There's some uh, 
gifts that women have that men don't have in terms of shapes and, and, and understanding that, that that our minds don't seem to be able to comprehend. But we're going to get to the point where you literally can look at the object in 3D. I visited a company in, in uh, California just a couple, you know, not too many months ago, and the, the screens are 3D. You don't even have to uh, have any glasses on at all. You just make sure you're on the right angle with it. If you get off angle, it'll go out of 3D, but if you want to go one step further, it's right back in 3D, and you can look at it at a variety of angles. And it can turn. you can turn it, you can look around, you can look at the back side. But what's more important is you can take a picture of your living room, and you can take that object and put it in the living room and see even if the color works with what you want to do. Now, we're getting to the point where uh, I think it makes a, a good a bit of sense to think about instead of having a box store, you have a warehouse where everything's in, which I'm sure Walmart and Kmart and everybody else would love to not have all this floor space they have to have to, for display and could put in shelves and tons and tons of things that they want to sell and then run a fleet of electric vehicles around delivering you know, stuff that you order because you gave somebody the you know, way to make that decision at home. And the nice thing about me is I'm not really great with a computer, but I'm okay with it. I can live with it. I can probably learn how to do it. I can't learn how to use Word, I can tell you that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, don't, and don't, I, I will never do a proposal again where you have to turn on that track changes thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I've been doing that all morning and all night. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but I think we're really at that point. That's why I mentioned the 3D printing. I think, you know, the Star Trek thing, you know, Earl Grey, hot please, cup with the tea in it. We well, ain't far from there. <laughs> I mean, we literally can print things out pretty quickly. And so that reality is somewhere not too far off. We were talking earlier about whether Google's thing is going to work about uh, you know, self-driving cars. And uh, I th you know, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. And the point was made that the car probably is safer than we are. We're not going to be tech, it's not going to be texting. Well, <laughs> you know? And so that reality, I think, is, is about to happen also. Where you're climbing your car and you don't have to be worried about it. It's, it's going to be safer than you are. And when it comes to, up to a stop sign, one of my pet peeves is that people forget their written test more quickly than anything else because yield to the right. No one understands when you come up to a stop what that means. And so you have to watch yourself. Make sure that they're not, you know, that, you know, then, then you get frustrated because they won't go, and then you go, and then finally they say, well, he's not going, and you turn right into you. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, anyway, you know, a car, you know, a smart car won't do that. It knows. So uh, yeah, I think that's, it. that's in the future, too. But think about that, being able to do your ordering right online. Because uh, I think we're getting close to I'm sorry. Anything else? Thank you very much. Uh